Lifelong Learning, A Taste of Pillar 2, are short presentations taught by Pillar instructors in partnership with the Pikes Peak Library District. This program is made possible as the result of a grant from Next 50 Initiative, a nonprofit organization dedicated to funding innovative, mission-driven initiatives that improve the lives of older adults and their caregivers. For more information, you can visit Pillar online at www.pillarinstitute.org or contact our Executive Director, Vicki Hefner, at director at pillarinstitute.org. Okay. Hello, my name is Sandy Halby. Welcome to a Taste of Pillar 2 class. This class is on the Imperial Easter eggs and Fabergé, the man who created them. In order to enjoy this class thoroughly, we'll talk just a little bit about Russian royalty, Tsar Alexander III and Nicholas II, and the House of Fabergé. Of course, it was the House of Fabergé who created the Imperial Easter Eggs, or as they're sometimes called, the Fabergé Eggs. The House of Romanov was the Royal House of Russia from 1613 to 1917, just a little over 300 years. It started with Tsar, uh, Tsar Michael Romanov. The Parliament of the Tsardom of Russia elected him the Tsar of Russia in 1613. During his reign is when Russia conquered most of Siberia with the help of the Cossacks and extended the Russian Empire all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Like most royal family trees, it's intertwined with cousins, other royal families, and disputes. And suffice it to say that eventually the royal line comes down to Alexander III in 1881. This is Tsar Alexander III. He reigned from 1881 to 1894. He was more than six feet tall. He was a very impressive man, known for his physical strength. He was very self-conscious about a cyst on the left side of his, known, on, of his nose and is usually sat, sat for photographs and portraits with the right side of his face most prominent. He wed Princess Dagmar of Denmark, who was actually his fourth cousin. There's a side story here though. Tsar Alexander III was actually in love with Maria at one point. He called Maria his Dusenka, his love. Another had actually proposed to Maria, but she really loved Alexander III also. Alexander III told his parents that he would give up the throne to marry Maria. But Alexander II made a deal with the King of Denmark for Alexander to, wear, to wed Dagmar, his fourth cousin, and the former fiance to his late elder brother, Nicholas. Alexander III realized that he must marry Dagmar. That was his duty. And in his diary, he wrote, Farewell, dear Dusenka, his pet name for Maria. Eventually, he grew fond of Dagmar, and they had five children together. Tsar Nicholas II was the oldest son of Alexander III and Dagmar. He reigned from 1894 to 1917, and he died in 1918. He was wed to Princess Alex of Germany, who actually changed her name to Alexandra. There's another side story here too. Nicholas III met Alex in 1884 when he visited Russia and they fell madly in love. However, their engagement was a disappointment to Alex III, who was anti-German and wanted Nicholas to marry Princess Helene of France. But Princess Helene resisted converting to Russian orthodoxy, and that was the end of that. So eventually the match between Alex and Nicholas II was approved, and they wed just days after Alexander III died. And here's Nicholas II and Alexandra's wedding, uh, excuse me, their engagement photo. Tsar Nicholas II and Alexandra had five children also. Now we'll talk just a little bit about the House of Fabergé. The Fabergé family traces their lineage back to northern France, but they fled there in around 1658 due to religious persecution. They were the House of Huguenots. The family moved to Germany, Estonia, and finally completed uh, their journey east and settled in St. Petersburg. In the 1830s, Gustave Fabergé trained as a goldsmith making gold boxes. And in 1841, his apprenticeship over, Gustave Fabergé earned the title of Master Goldsmith. 
1842, he opened his own shop and he added the acute accent over the last E of his name to appeal to the aristocracy of the time. He married that year and he had his first son, Peter Carl, who became known as Carl Fabergé. Their second son, Agathon, was born 16 years later. The business, Fabergé, was and still is quite a success. Eventually, Gustav Fabergé retired to Dresden, Germany, leaving Fabergé to trusted managers while Carl continued his education abroad. Carl Fabergé, like the son of so many wealthy vis businessmen of the time, toured uh, Europe on a grand tour, as was the custom. He studied with the most prominent jewelers and goldsmiths of the time in Germany, France, and England, and as well as studying art and jewelry in museums across Europe. At age 26, he returned to St. Petersburg, and he worked with his father's senior goldsmiths. In 1882, Carl Fabergé took over running the firm and is named a master goldsmith. That same year, his brother joined the business as a designer. This was the mark that they put on their jewelry. And here's a picture of Carl Fabergé in later life. These are some of the other jewelry that they made at the house of Fabergé, tiara, some pins, and a picture frame. Around the same time that Carl Fabergé took over the business, he was asked to repair and restore some objects from the Hermitage Museum in Russia. Based on that work done, Fabergé was invited to exhibit some pieces at the Pan-Russian exhibit in Moscow. One of the pieces that was displayed was a replica of a fourth century gold bangle from the Hermitage Museum, similar to the one that's depicted here. Tsar Alexander III said he could not tell it from the original, and thus Fabergé became known to the House of Roma's Romanov. Alexander III ordered some samples from the House of Fabergé, and those pieces were displayed in the Hermitage Museum as an example of superb contemporary Russian craftsmanship. As a result, the House of Fabergé was bestowed with the title of Goldsmith by special appointment to the Imperial Crown, and that led to the commissioning of the stunning imperial eggs. The imperial eggs were a series of eggs totaling 50 eggs in all that began in 1885 and ran until 1916. Some consider the imperial eggs the greatest commission of objects to art ever. All of the eggs contained a surprise, a trinket or a jewel inside. 10 eggs were produced from 1885 to 1893 for Alexander III. The first egg was meant to be an Easter present for his wife, and initially the imperial eggs was to contain a diamond ring, but he changed his mind and substituted a ruby pendant. 40 eggs were created during the rule of Nicholas II, two each year, one for his mother, the dowager, and one for his wife. In addition to the imperial eggs, there are other Fabergé eggs. Some are called the Kelch eggs. Fabergé made 12 eggs for Alexander Kelch, a Siberian gold industrialist, as gifts for his wife. They are technically Fabergé eggs, but they weren't as elaborate as the imperial eggs and were not unique as a couple of them were copies of other designs. There are nine other Fabergé eggs, also produced by the Fabergé house, that were uh, produced during that era, and four were owned by Victor Vecklesburg. We'll hear more about Victor Vecklesburg in a while. 44 imperial eggs survive today. In 1927, Joseph Stalin sold many of the eggs to buyers outside of Russia. Currently, 10 eggs are on display at Moscow's Kremlin Armory Museum. The second largest collection of Fabergé eggs belongs to, belonged to Malcolm Forbes and was displayed on, in New York City. It was nine eggs and around 180 other Fabergé objects, pins, tiaras, things like that. The collection was going to be auctioned in February 2004 at Sotheby's, but right before the auction began, the entire collection was purchased by Russian businessman Victor Vexelberg. This was the very first Fabergé egg made. This is known as the jewel hen egg. 
its opaque white enamel shell, the outside of the egg, open to reveal a yellow, oh, yellow gold yolk, and inside the yolk revealed a gold hen egg that opened up, uh, excuse me, a gold hen that opened up. The hen contained a diamond replica of the imperial crown, and there was a small ruby pendant was, that was there. The last two elements, the uh, diamond replica of the crown and the ruby pendant have been lost. I've got a better picture of it here next. You can see there the white enamel egg, and then there was the yellow yolk, and inside that was the hen. And the hen opened up, and that's where those two trinkets were inside. This was the very first Fabergé egg ever made, the imperial egg. This egg is currently owned by Victor Vexelberg. He's a Ukrainian-born Russian businessman, the owner of Renova, a Russian conglomerate. His fortune is estimated at a little over $11 billion, making him the 119th richest person in the world. He owns nine imperial eggs. He also owns two Kelch eggs and four other Fabergé eggs. He has quite the collection. The second Fabergé egg was hen with sapphire pendant. Unfortunately, there's no known photographs or even illustrations of this egg, only descriptions of it. It's described as a hen of gold and rose diamonds taking a sapphire egg out of a nest with the sapphire loosely held in the hen's beak. The hen and basket were reportedly both made of gold studded with hundreds of rose cut diamonds, but the written description of the egg sometimes conflicts with the others. The last documented location of the egg is from an archive of the provisional government Russian of provisional Russian government's inventory in 1922 when the egg was held in the Armory Palace of the Kremlin. From then on, it's lost to history. This is the third Fabergé egg that was ever made. It's called the Third Imperial. The Third Imperial is an 18 karat gold egg resting on a gold ring held up by three sets of lions legs ending in lion's paws. You can see them here. There's gold roses and leaves and gold alloy joining in the, in the middle by a sapphire. Above each sapphire is a gold bow, tiny diamonds, and a large diamond in the front. The large diamond in the front is a clasp that reveals the surprise. It has a clock inside. This egg has got a fascinating story. This egg was actually owned by a scrap dealer in America. He, went, uh, he owned it, he bought it in 2002 for a purchase price of $13,302. He was intending to sell it for scrap gold, but prospective buyers thought he had overestimated the price and turned him down. He had this in his kitchen for years, and he was going to sell it for just scrap and sell the jewels. And one night, out of curiosity, he got on the internet and he looked at it, was looking up, um, Googled, he Googled egg and Vercheron Constantine, which was the name etched on the clock that's inside the egg. And the result was an article that had been published in a London newspaper about a missing imperial egg. And he recognized the egg in the picture in the article. He said he knew instantaneously he had the third imperial egg. And he contacted the dealer in London that was listed in the article about imperial eggs. The expert uh, flew to the Midwest of the United States and he walked into a very modest home in the Midwest next to a highway and a Dunkin' Donuts. And there was that third imperial egg sitting next to some cupcakes on a counter and it became a very uh, famous picture. The expert said he knew instantaneously it was the missing third imperial egg that this scrap dealer had intended to sell for scrap gold and jewel. And this expert said it was like being Indiana Jones and finding the lost ark. Here's that photograph of that third imperial egg sitting next to a, a, a cupcake on a kitchen counter in the Midwest. This is that picture of the egg being removed from its stand. And here's the egg with the open, with that clock inside. That's where he found the name on the back of the clock that he looked up on the internet. 
The scrap dealer sold the egg for $33 million to a private collector. Can you imagine that? Having it for all those years, trying to sell it for scrap metal and finding out that it's actually the third imperial egg and selling it for $33 million. Quite the story about the third imperial egg. This is another one of the more beautiful imperial eggs. This is called the diamond trellis. It's got jadeite, gold, rose-cut diamonds, and it's lined with white satin. The surprise inside was an elephant figurine, and it was thought to have been lost for many years, but it was actually identified in 2015 as being part of the collection of the British Royal Collection Trust. This photograph of the two of them together, I've, been, I've read that this is the only photograph that was ever taken of the surprise and the egg together. I don't really know if that's true or not. I don't know whether this is actually a combination photo or whether this is a real photo of the two together. This is the Renaissance egg. This is, some consider this to be one of the most beautiful Fabergé eggs. This was the last one given by Alexander III to Maria. The surprise inside the egg is missing. However, this Fabergé egg is known as the resurrection egg, and it's considered to be a separate egg, not one of the imperial eggs. It's the only Fabergé egg to explicitly reference the Easter story. The conjecture is that this is actually the surprise that was inside the Renaissance egg. In, in other words, the resurrection egg actually goes inside the Renaissance egg, and both of these are owned by Victor Vexelberg. This is the Lilies of the Valley egg. It's covered in pearls. And the surprise is that the three portraits rise up out of the egg when one of the pearl buttons is twisted. And the portraits are of Nicholas II with his two oldest daughters. This is an egg that's owned by Victor Vexelberg. And this is probably one of the more famous imperial uh, eggs. Uh, this one is the coronation egg. It was made to commemorate Empress Alexandra's coronation. The surprise inside is a replica of her carriage, and there was probably an emerald or diamond pendant inside the carriage. This is owned by Victor Vexelberg, and this one is often displayed at the Hermitage and various uh, museums in Russia. One of the most uh, better, better known imperial eggs. Very, very beautiful and very elaborate. And the carriage, the wheels actually do turn. This is another one that's a fun one. This is the orange tree egg, the bay, or, or that's called the bay tree. You turn a tiny lever disguised as one of the fruits on the tree and a little hinged door opens and a songbird appears. It flaps its wings and turn its heads and open its beak, so it's quite complicated. This is another one that's owned by Victor Vexelberg. This is the winter egg, was made in 1913. It was designed by Alma uh, Peel, the only female workmaster at Fabergé. The exterior is frost and ice crystals, which is actually 1,660 diamonds. The surprise inside is a flower basket. The basket is made of platinum and gold. And this egg is very small. It's just over four inches tall. This egg was sold in the United States for $9.6 million at an auction in 2002 and was purchased by the Emir of Qatar. And this egg was one of the last eggs. This is the Carillion birch egg. This egg was due to be completed and delivered to the, delivered to the Tsar in 1917, but the February Revolution came along and Nicholas II was forced to abdicate on 15 March. On the 25th of March, Fabergé, Fabergé sent the Tsar an invoice. It was actually addressed to Mr. Romanov rather than Tsar of all the Russians. That's quite unique. Nicholas paid 12,500 rubles for that egg and it was delivered to the palace. However, Duke Alex Alexandrovich was at the palace and the Duke fled before it arri arrived. The egg remained in the palace until it was stolen and now this one is at the Fabergé Museum in Baden-Baden, Germany. This is the constellation egg that's unfinished. It's blue glass with stars marked in diamonds. 
There's a clock me mechanism inside, and that some dispute there may be a second constellation egg. We don't know for sure. And now we're going to do just a quick run through of the imperial eggs. Just a very quick, you've already seen some of the more special or the unique ones. Of course, this is the very first one, the hen egg. The second one is missing, as I said. This is the third imperial that has that unique story. This is the Danish palaces. The surprise inside was a little fold-out stand-up of all the palaces. This is the memory of Azaz. That was the royal yacht. This is the diamond trellis. This is the one that had the surprise inside with the elephant that actually is in the British Museum. This is the Caucasus egg, one of the two eggs that was red in color. The Renaissance egg, which is just beautiful. The rosebud, the surprise inside was the rosebud, which I believe had a uh, uh, two surprises inside, jewels, of course. This is the blue serpent clock. Prince Albert uh, II of Monaco actually owns this one. This is the rock crystal egg. This is actually in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. This is called the 12 monograms. This one is in Washington, DC. This is that imperial coronation egg that is so beautiful. This is that lilies of the valley egg. This one is the pelican egg. It's got a pelican on top with a nest with five babies. That's to, made to represent the imperial family with the five children. This is at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia. This is the bouquet of lilies clock. This is one of the few Fabergé eggs that has never left Russia. It's still in Russia. It's the, at the Kremlin Armory. This is the pansy egg. This one is done in the Art Nouveau style. This is one of my favorites. This is the Trans-Siberian Railway. This has got a route map of the Trans-Siberian Railway engaged in, uh, engraved in silver across the face. The train is the length of one foot and it has a diamond headlight and ruby tail lights. The train has a gold key that you can wind up the train to make it run. This is the cockerel clock. There's a red cockerel on top. This one is from 1901, Basket of Flowers. You can see how delicate that is. I believe I read that this one is like only four inches tall also, so it's very small, so you can see how in, in, intricate the detail is. And those are all diamonds across the basket and in, in the intricate weaving there. This is the Gachina Palace. The surprise inside that palace is not removable. However, in a later egg, there is one where the palace is removable. This is the clover leaf egg. This is another one that has never left Russia. The surprise inside, I believe, is missing on this one. This is the Empire Nephrite egg. This is in a private collection in New York City. This is the Peter the Great egg. This is another one in Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. This is the Moscow Kremlin egg. This is another one that has never left Russia. This is the swan egg. You can see how beautiful that is. And the trinket inside has survived on this one. You can see the trinket is a little necklace with a jewel at the end of it. This is the rose trellis egg. This is the love trophies egg. This is in a private collection. This is the Alexander Palace egg. And this one, you can see that the palace, which is the surprise inside, does come out of the egg. This is called the peacock egg. And the peacock can be lifted from the tree that sits inside that egg that's very clear. And you can wind it up and place it on a flat surface. The peacock actually struts around. Its head moves and its tail spread. It took three years to make this egg. 
This one is the standard yacht. This was the family boat. This is the colonnade. This is part of the Royal Collection in London, England. This is Alexander III equestrian egg. This is called the 15th anniversary egg. It commemorates the 15th anniversary of the coronation of Nicholas II. Victor Vexelberg has this one. We already talked about the bay tree egg. You can see the little bird on top that pops up there. This is the Zarovich egg. This one is another one in the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. The Nepo Napoleonic egg. And this is the Romanov tercentury egg. I hope I pronounced that wrong. It celebrates the 300 year of the Romanov dynasty. This one was made in 1913. And this is the winter egg. By the way, the flowers in the basket are nestled in gold moss. This is another delightful one. This is the mosaic egg. Cameos of the children of the surprise inside. This is the Catherine the Great egg. Now we're entering the World War II era, so we've got Red Cross eggs. This is one of the first Red Cross eggs. This is another one that has imperial portraits. This is women from the House of Romanov wearing uniforms of the Red Cross workers. And this is the steel military egg. This is the one egg that has no gemstones on the exterior. And this is the Order of St. George egg. This is actually the last egg that was ever delivered. And this is owned by Victor Vexelberg, of course. And then the last egg was the Carillion birch egg, which we've already talked about. So there you go. Those are the 50 imperial eggs we've talked about. Of course, the French Revol the excuse me, the uh, February Revolution forced Nicholas II to abdicate, and Nicholas and his family were exiled first to Siberia. Then they were moved to a small town in the Urals, and in July 1918, the family was executed. After the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks nationalized the House of Fabergé, and the Fabergé family fed, fled to Switzerland. Uh, Karl Fabergé died in 1920 in Switzerland. The Romanov palaces were ransacked and most of the treasures were moved to the Kremlin on the order of Vladimir Lenin. In 1927, Joseph Stalin sold many of the eggs after their value had been appraised by Agathon Fabergé, the younger brother of Karl Fabergé. Between 1930 and 1933, 14 imperial eggs left Russia, presumably sold by Stalin. Many of the eggs were sold to Armand Hammer, the president of Occidental Petroleum and a personal friend of Lenin, and whose father was founder of the United States Communist Party. More were sold to Emanuel Snowman of the London antique uh, dealer Wart Wartsky. So here's where the 44 eggs are today. 10 are in the Kremlin army, uh, armory, nine are owned by Victor Vexelberg and displayed at his private Fabergé Museum. Five, surprisingly, are the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. That's the largest collection outside of Russia. Three in the Royal Collection owned by Elizabeth II. And you can see down the list of who owns them. Four are in private collections also. So of those 44, there are six that are still out there. That second egg with the sapphire pendant that went missing in 1922. There's another one, the cherub with chariot egg from 1888. 
the mauve egg, although Victor Vexelberg owns the surprise that was in the egg. And then these three, the Royal Danish, the Necessaire egg, and the Alex III commemorative egg, those are still missing. So like I tell people, if you have perhaps a Russian ancestor in your family and they have something stuck in the attic or in a jewelry box somewhere, take a good close look at it and see if maybe it's one of these missing imperial eggs. So there you have the stories of the 50 imperial eggs. Thank you for joining us today for this Taste of Pillar 2 presentation. And we hope that you'll look at some other pillar classes to take in the future. We hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.